Okay, so this is the follow-up video to the video about faith, um, in which we keep talking about the questions that you guys asked about faith. And what I realized is that really these are all questions about salvation. So I'm going to start with this one here. As somebody who never grew up in a very religious environment, do you think that someone who believes in God but does not attend church or other religious events is not established in Christianity yet? Um, does one have to attend church to be a Christian, or can a home prayer and good works slash faith be good enough? Um, and then we have um, another question that says, there are people that do not go to church, but believe in God and follow what he commands to do. Then there are people who go to church all the time, but do not follow God's commands. Lie, selfish, don't love their neighbor. Do you think that going to church is necessary to be in the good graces of God for salvation? Um, these are great questions here. Um, these are great questions here about you know, what does it take to be saved? Um, I'm not going to directly answer these questions. Instead, I, I think it's more effective for me to just kind of tell you, here's, here's my thought on salvation. What I would say is that salvation is up to God and that we do not get to decide who or what makes somebody saved, not saved, those kinds of things. So the first most important principle that I have when I think about what is salvation, how does it happen, how do you attain it, is always that salvation is not something I'm in control of or any other human is in control. Salvation is always something that is completely and totally in the control of God up above. So once we understand that, then we need to be able to understand that since it's out of our control, we can't assume that we know, oh, okay, if I do the following six things or the following two things, that I will have, that I will be able to force my way into heaven. You can't walk up to the pearly gates when you die and say to God, well, I went to church 51 out of 52 ooh, Sundays a year, um, and I only missed that one time uh, just because I needed a vacation every once in a while. Um, you can't say those kinds of things. You're not. That's not going to work to get you into heaven. The only thing that gets you into heaven is the grace of God, period. So that leads to the question, well, how do you know whether you have the grace of God? Who gets the grace of God? Well, I think the New Testament overall despite, gives us the following picture. There are always going to be verses that you can appeal to that would give us a slightly different impression of what I'm about to say. And I could be wrong about this. But my interpretation of the overall New Testament, not just one or two or five specific verses, is this. I believe that God has grace on those who are consciously or unconsciously attempting to build and be part of the kingdom of God. And so those Christians who are, who say, I, I believe in you, Lord. I have faith in you. I think that faith in Jesus is a part of the kingdom of God. So those who are Say So those who want to say that they are saved by faith and their faith in Jesus alone have a good point to make. Because I think that 
God, part of the kingdom of God is God wants people who will worship him and acknowledge him as creator and love him and all those good things. And so those kinds of people, I think, will be part of the kingdom, uh, will be part, who are saved because they are expressing a desire to be part of the kingdom of God. Now, what about those people who are who never express, who never say, "I want to be saved." Who? What about those people who um, don't make a faith commitment, but are good people? At least they appear to be good people to us. That's harder. I think that Jesus wants us to make a faith commitment. I do, but I also don't think that God is cold-hearted. I think that there I think that it's possible that God will have grace on those people who even if they don't make a faith commitment that there has been some sort of part of their life that somehow some way is connected to the overall will of God to bring about the kingdom of God that Jesus always wanted, the world in which there is no violence, no crime, no racism, where we are all able to love one another, where we all have enough to eat. Those people who intentionally dedicate themselves to making those kinds of things happen, I suspect that God will have grace on those people. What about those people who intentionally say, no, I will not make a faith commitment. Those people who intentionally say no to God, but are still good people. I'm worried about those people. Those kind of people make me nervous because when you say that you're intentionally going to refuse to make that faith commitment, not just sort of avoid the question, not just be sort of agnostic about it, but the people who intentionally say no to God, those people I'm worried about because As I said a few minutes ago, faith is part of the kingdom of God, believing in God, worshiping in God, loving God. Those kinds of things are part of the kingdom of God just as much as a desire to fight racism, a desire to um, love your neighbor, fight poverty, those things. And so when you reject an aspect of the kingdom, in a very intentional sort of way, then I I would worry about whether God will have grace on you. Because I think God is willing to respect your choice to say no to him. I think that's something that, I think that's something God's willing to do is if he allows us to make choices, God will respect those choices. Now, What about those kinds of Christians who are not so good at being Christians? This is the really, really hard one. What about those kinds of Christians who say, I'm a Christian. I go to church. I pray. But they're racists. And there are people in this world who are like that. And I don't think we can just hand wave them away and say, oh, they're not really Christians. Because I think there are are and have been people throughout the centuries, throughout the ages, who have made genuine, serious faith commitments, but have at the same time never really learned what Jesus is ultimately talking about in the Sermon on the Mount. I would be worried about those people because I think that God may say to them, how could you claim to worship me but not have learned my lessons? I think Matthew chapter 25 speaks pretty well to this idea, especially the the last half of Matthew chapter 25 is what I'm thinking of. The separation of the sheep and the goats is the story that I'm thinking of there. 
Um, but there is... There does seem to be something about this idea in the New Testament, about the idea of those who believe in Jesus, somehow, some way, God wants to have faith, wants to have grace for those kinds of people, even if they are colossal screw-ups when it comes to their daily lives. So all this to say, I want you to remember, I want you to remember that we cannot force God to save us. No matter how many times we pray the sinner's prayer, no matter how many times we say, look, I have faith in Jesus, I love God, all those kinds of things, that cannot save you. What saves you is the grace of God and the grace of God alone. I believe that God has grace on those kinds of people who make confessions of faith and are repentant. I I do tend to have a bigger broader view of God's understanding of self uh, of God's understanding of grace. Because of his love, I think God is willing to extend grace on a whole host of people who desire to be a part of the kingdom of God in some way shape or form. I think that the people that I'm most worried about are the people who and somehow intentionally say no to anything and everything there is about the kingdom of God. And so I think the people who have committed atrociously evil acts in the world, those kinds of people, I would be genuinely worried for their salvation. But I would also say that God's grace is abundant, and I think that there is always an opportunity for repentance. Jesus tells a lot of parables about how God smiles about when people repent and turn away from their life of sin, and I think there's always an opportunity and hope for repentance. Um, I hope by me saying this, you've you probably don't have a straightforward answer from this question to this question. And I don't want you to have a straightforward one except to know that it's about the grace of God. And that's because I want you to walk away from this class having a sense that the New Testament has a bigger, broader understanding of salvation than just simple prayers, getting people to walk the aisle at church and saying, that's it that person saved, nothing else in life matters. I hope you have an idea that salvation is deeper, more significant. It is not a trivial trivial thing in anybody's life. Now, because I've, I've lingered on that for a very, very long time. Um, there's one other question about salvation that I want to, that I do want to answer. It says in Hebrews, it warns that it is impossible for those who have been enlightened and then fallen away to be restored to repentance. Why is this different than some of our previous readings where the point of Paul's letters were to lead people back to having faith in Christ? Tough question. Um, who am I, who am I to question what the author of the book of Hebrews writes? I think what the author of the book of Hebrews is ultimately talking about are people who intentionally say no to God in a very definitive and absolute way. I think what the author of Hebrews is talking about are people who say, I have seen the glory of God. I have experienced the fullness of Christ. I have had a moment of salvation. And then later on, they say, no, I reject this. I reject the ways of God. And I think Hebrews understands that God honors our choices. God gave us the ability to choose him or to not choose him. And I think that God is willing to honor that statement for us. I 
I have to believe the people who have experienced the fullness and the glory of God and then choose to reject him would be few and far between. But they apparently do happen. And it's a very tragic thing. And I think Hebrews is seriously concerned about those people because I think it suggests maybe once you say no, are those... Are those the kind of people who would ever repent of their sins? Maybe that's what it's getting at. Maybe that's what the author of Hebrews is getting at, is that once you've experienced the fullness of of the glory of God and you understand what salvation is and you say no to it, why would those people have a moment where they would turn around and repent a second time? Because they've clearly made their choice. Maybe that's what Hebrews is driving at. At the same time, as I said before, there's always an opportunity for repentance. I think God celebrates those people. Um, The overall message of Hebrews is one that says, don't take salvation lightly. Don't pray the sinner's prayer and do nothing with your life. Don't choose to become a Christian and just treat Christianity as some sort of trivial aspect. The kinds of Christians who, the kinds of people who become Christians and do not strive to build the kingdom of God. Again, I worry about those kinds of people because I think there's an aspect of those people who are sort of kind of going following along the lines of where the book of Hebrews tells us not to go. Overall, um, I'm willing to emphasize, I, I emphasize the grace of God, but I take very seriously the warning of the book of Hebrews to not take your faith trivially or lightly. It is something to be guarded. Um, I hope these have been helpful what I want you to do is I don't want you to walk away from this video thinking that um, there are that there are super easy, straightforward answers to these big questions. These are big questions that deserve lots of thought and reflection. And I'm just one guy with I'm just one guy. I'm just one of the many teachers at UMHB. And I'm just one of many thousands of people who teach New Testament. I could be wrong about these things. So what I want to encourage you guys ultimately to do is take what I've said here in this video and these other videos and think about it for yourself. But please, 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 please don't just take one verse and just say, oh, that's it. That's all there is to it. Look at all these different verses and try to set, try to put together a picture of what God is trying to say to us. Think about the context of these verses. Think about um, the situations going on. And then develop your own answer, but don't make it a simple answer. Make it one that is thoughtful and comprehensive and built on the words of Jesus, the words of Paul, the words of of some of these general epistles. Put it all together and decide for yourselves. That's what I'm ultimately hoping you guys will, will do with this class. All right, this one's almost 20 minutes long, which is plenty long. So let's call this one a day. Oh, I keep forgetting. These are YouTube videos. So I have to end them all every time with hit that like and subscribe button. And I will talk with you with the next video soon. Bye.